I don't know if I would agree with that last statement. I love Oreo cookies. Um, if you make a, a really great Oreo cookie, then we might be in a good spot. But um, a bad homemade cookie compared to Oreo. If you aren't good at making cookies, bring Oreos. It's, for me, it's one and the same. <laughs> good morning, church. It's great to be with you this morning on this beautiful day. Uh, we are in, uh, we're coming up to our final weeks in the, this series, this long series that we are calling Gifted. It's uh, a series that we are talking about what gifts that, that God the Holy Spirit has given to us to make a difference, to make an impact on the world that God created. Each of us has been uniquely gifted and positioned to impact our world, to impact others on behalf of Jesus using the gifts that God the Holy Spirit gave to us. So, throughout this series, we've touched on pretty much almost all of the gifts up until this point. And, and the last few times that I've been teaching, I've been kind of planted in Ephesians chapter 4. And that's where we'll be again this morning. But before we do that, uh, let's pray together. Good and gracious God, we thank you for today. We thank you for this beautiful, beautiful weather. God, I'm praying that whatever words come out of my mouth today is not from my own understanding, not from my own wisdom, but from your heart, Lord. We are here to hear from you, God. So we surrender this time to you this morning. We ask all of this in your son's name. Amen. If you are here for the very first time with us here at the River Church, we are honored that you've taken some of your time out of this beautiful weekend to be here with us. If you, if you, that is you, if you're coming in just for the first time or the second time and you haven't been here for a long time, let me catch you up on what's happened in this series. For the last two months or so, we've talked about this, this spiritual gifts. Um, there are a number of gifts given to us by God the Holy Spirit, and we find these in the New Testament. We find there are different categories of gifts, so we've broken them down in three different categories. The first is the motivational gifts. And these are found in Romans chapter 12. That These gifts represent what God does in each of us to shape our perspective on life and to motivate our words and our actions. So gifts like encouragement, gifts like serving, mercy, administration, all of these are what we would call motivational gifts. The second category we've talked about is manifestational gifts, and those come to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And these gifts represent the work that God does through the life of the body, through us in a given situation to demonstrate his supernatural powers. So words of wisdom, words of knowledge, gifts of healing all fit into that category. But today, and for the last few times that you've seen me, we have focused on Ephesians chapter 4, or what's called the ministry gifts, um, or the Jesus gifts. And I, I want to read this again, and, and I've read this multiple times for you over the, the last couple couple weeks, but I, I want to bring this back to you for context, because one, reading more than just the one verse with the, the, the five gifts helps us understand a, a little bit more about what the author is trying to tell us. And two, I believe that, that the potential of this scripture verse for the church is huge. Ephesians 4 has the potential to unlock things that, that the church has, has not seen before, kingdom work that the church has not done before. In my opinion, if we look at the whole of Scripture, I believe that, that this one Scripture verse is the best way to, to understand how we as the church are supposed to be used. That we are, as the church, are supposed to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. And I believe that, that in this, in Ephesians 4, we find five roles that really define that so well for us. So here it is, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. We're going to change it up for you this week. We've read different versions today. We're going to read from the message. A lot of people love that. So we'll lead, read it from the message this morning. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. He handed out gifts above and below, filled heavens with his gifts, filled earth with his gifts. He handed out gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor, teacher, to train Christ's followers in skilled servant work, working within Christ's body, the church, until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with each other, efficient and graceful in response to God's Son, fully mature adults, fully developed within and without, fully alive like Christ. God wants us to grow up, to know the whole truth and to tell it in love like Christ in everything. We take our lead from Christ who is the source of everything we do. He keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us, 
so that we will grow up healthy in God, robust in love. So the author here, Paul, is essentially saying that we as the church, all of us, are the body of Christ. You and me, and the generations of Christians before us, and the generations of Christians after us, all of us are one body under the head of Christ. And every part of that body, Paul says, is meant to to build up the rest of the body. We're we're put here, we're, we're given gifts to build up the body. And as the church, we lose sight of this sometimes because we get caught up in what I would like to call a hierarchical model or a pyramid model of the church where somebody as important is on the very top, usually it's the pastor, and all of the like, all of the things that happen kind of flow down. But if you look at Scripture, if you look specifically in the Gospels, you see what Jesus does. He doesn't lead from a, a pyramid where he's sitting on top of the pyramid. No, he really flips the whole thing on its end. And from the, from the cornerstone, as the cornerstone of the church, he sits there on the bottom of the pyramid and supports the rest. Does that make sense? And that's important for us to understand as a church because we get caught up in this, this, this business model of the church where there's going to be a person on top and the rest of the stuff flows down. But if you think about the way the church is built, it's not from the top down, it's from the bottom up. As Jesus as the cornerstone, this is important, that, that we, aren't, we aren't supposed to lord over people, we're not supposed to be above people, but as we join with Christ as the cornerstone, we journey upward We're not meant to grow by standing on top of people to gain status and power. We're we're meant to to join with Jesus on the bottom to support one another, to build each other up, to cast Jesus' mission for the world wider. And we need to understand that the roles from Ephesians 4 help us understand how important all of us are in the body, how all of us are are important to, to, to... to journey with Jesus, to to partner with Jesus as we build the body up. Ephesians 4 gives us these five gifts, but these uh, the rest of the gifts that we've talked about all help us understand that each of us has been given gifts and no gift is more important than the next. And every gift is meant to build up the church. This is important for us because we lose sight of this as the church. Churches believe that people who are standing up in front on Sunday have all the gifts that the church would need. And because they have the ability to teach the Word of God well, or they're able to inspire or encourage, or they're able to cast a God-sized vision, the church, we, have, have gotten lost in the sense of, well, they can just do the work of the church for us. But if, as we've said over and over and over again in this series, Jesus is in all of us, which means not just one or two of us are meant to do the work of the church, but all of us have the gifts of the Spirit. All of us have been given gifts in order to be gifts for the world, to build up the church, to spread the mission of Christ in the world. Because let's face it, if if only one person had all of those gifts, it's not any of us, right? Only one person in all of time has had all of the spiritual gifts at his side. Jesus has been the best apostle. Jesus was the best prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. But get this, because Jesus is in all of us, all of those roles, all of the gifts are going to come out in us. Not just one of us, not just me, but in all of us. So it's important for us as the River Church to understand, to begin to identify who the apostles are among us. Who are the prophets? Who are the evangelists? Who are the pastors? Who are the shepherds? Who are the teachers? And as we've talked about the spiritual gift inventory, that's the reason why we want you to take it. That's why we want you to to understand your, your spiritual gifts. We want you to know because we want to equip you to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world today. The charge in Ephesians 4 is not for the church to just do its own thing, but to, to raise up, to encourage and equip those who have the giftings. Because when you use one of these gifts, you are essentially Jesus for the world. We've taken up this mindset as the church. We want to invite all of you 
to become more aware of your giftings. And we want to encourage you and we want to lift you up. We want to build you up as you explore those gifts in your life. And then we want to equip you to go outside those doors and be Jesus' hands and feet in the world. And for us, we really believe Ephesians 4 is kind of where it starts. In the church and in the body, all of us are, have the potential to be apostles. All of us have the potential to be prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. In the last few weeks, I've introduced subtitles that a theologian by the name of J.R. Woodward coined to help describe these these gifts, and it's helped me immensely to understand what it is Paul's trying to say. So he gives, he gives titles to each of the five gifts. So the prophet he calls the dream awakener. Or, sorry, the apostle he calls the dream awakener. The prophet is the heart revealer. The evangelist is the storyteller. The pastor is the soul healer. And today we're going to finish up talking about the last gift, teaching, or what he calls the light giver. And as I came across these, these different titles for these five gifts, it just opened, opened up my understanding of what the potential would be for us to, to really realize our own gifting in a sense of Ephesians 4, a church built on Ephesians 4. So this morning we're talking about the light giver. And light givers, they shed light on Scripture so that we can be transformed by the Word of God. We're not just here to receive. We're not here to just consume. We're here to take what God has for us and to do something with it. So light givers point us toward the truth of what God's word was revealed with the intention of transformation. So it's important for us to understand who the light givers are in our church or who the light givers are in the making. This morning we're going to go through a number of attributes of the roles of the light giver and I hope that if, if you yourself are a light giver or you are like related to a light giver or you know someone who's a light giver, you just, God's going to work in you in, in that today. So the first attribute we're talking about is light givers don't aim just to give knowledge. They want to lead others to understanding. Light givers don't just give knowledge but lead others to understanding. Now in this series we've talked about manifestational gifts, the manifestational gifts specifically of the words of wisdom and words of knowledge. And the best light givers among us are great at gathering information, gathering knowledge, and passing that wisdom that was gained from that knowledge on to others. The best light givers don't have to stand here on Sunday morning and give a message. They don't have to write a book. They don't, they don't have to lead a Bible study. Light givers can do all of those things, but that's not their primary goal. Their goal is to give understanding to others about the Word. They realize that the goal is not to consume the Word, but to, to, not to gain knowledge of the Word, but to, to understand what the Word is and how it's relevant to us. Now, in high school, in college, I was really good at taking knowledge and turning around and doing well on exams. I was... I was just good at, at knowledge. Like that was, I, my brain was really great at just reading something and being like, okay, I can take a test on it. I was a great test taker. I was really good at fulfilling the requirements that were put in front of me. But truth be told, I, I didn't understand a lot of what I was reading. I didn't understand much of the knowledge. I was really good at filling the little bubbles in on the test, but I would, that was it. Like as soon as I was done with that information, I purged it. It didn't, it didn't soak in. And some of you, that might be true for you. Exact same story in high school, in college. It just, you just learned the things just to learn them, just to take tests to get a good grade so that you could get a good job. Like, that's pretty much it. And for some of you, that's true. Some of you, like, you understand things much better, and I respect that. And almost, I wish I could have more of that. But we do the same thing with the Bible sometimes, too. Like we read and we read and we read and we read. And some of us just love to consume the Word of God. But if you would ask us 30 minutes after reading it what we read, we wouldn't be able to tell you. What good is it if you have the information if you don't understand it? So the goal for light givers is not to have others consume information, but to help them understand it and be transformed by it. Now if we could wrap our minds around the idea that the living God is with us and in us all the time, and we never read anything else from Scripture, we would be the best Christians. 
Because if we embrace the understanding that the Scripture really points to that in His goodness, God is always faithful. He, he sent His Son to die for us. He calls us His own no matter who we are or what we do. If we were to really understand that, embrace it and live it out, we'd be in a really great place. But the problem is, we lose sight of that. We walk away from God. We walk away from what it means to, to read Scripture and what Scriptures are trying to teach us. And as a result, you all show up here. And you say, I, I read my Bible, but I just, I'm not getting anything out of it. So I, the more I consume, the, the more I sit here, the more, the more I sit in Bible studies or small groups, the more I do that, maybe I'll, just, I'll get to a point where I just understand God more. So you keep coming back to that, that again and again. You keep coming back to that assurance that God loves you no matter what, again and again. That God calls you his own again and again. Jesus and light givers among us, they say to us as the body, the more you consume, that, that's great. You can consume all the information you want, but if you don't understand it, you lose it. Don't just consume the word. Aim to understand the heart of God. Don't just consume the word. Be challenged by it and understand it. Jesus, all the time, would come into contact with these religious leaders, these Pharisees and Sadducees, all these high and mighty religious powerhouses at the time, and, and they could recite any of the scriptures at the drop of a hat. But hear what Jesus says about them, Matthew chapter 23. Then Jesus said to the crowd and to his disciples, the teacher of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. Break. You must be... Do what they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They do not live out the understanding of the Scriptures. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make, phylactery, they make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. Phylacteries were boxes that contained scripture verses and they wear them on their arm and they wear them on their forehead. Verse 6. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. You have to understand, these men could just run circles around people with the knowledge that they had on the Scriptures. But Jesus here basically calls them out and he says, you're clueless. You don't get it. And Jesus is always rebuking them. He's, he's telling them, like, you're not, you're not hitting the point. You, you might have all the information, but you don't understand what, what the Word of God is saying. So then he would turn around and he'd tell them parables. He'd tell his, his friends parables to make these con complex concepts easily understood. He would tell these stories to help the less knowledgeable, not the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but the, the uneducated, those who have not been around the faith. He'd tell them stories in which way they could understand the, the, the meaning, the, the understanding behind the, the Scripture. He used these stories to help them understand. And the disciples would ask, why are you telling us stories? Why aren't you speaking in big, lofty words? And in chapter 13, he says this, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more. They will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. So light givers, like Jesus, feel this sense of responsibility and a calling to help people not just check a religious box that says, yep, I've read that scripture, I've been there, but move people from knowledge to understanding. One of the, the questions that I think I get the most, especially as a youth pastor, is how, do, how, how would, should I read the Bible, Zach? What, what's the best way to read the Bible? And I, I once sat with a group of, of church leaders and I asked this question. You know, when, when you're asked this question, what do you say? And there was one guy, he says this. I go for quality, not quantity. And I looked at him, I said, what do you mean? And he, he told me, the shortest Bible verse in all of Scripture, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept, two words, right? 
He says it has the power to transform more than if I were just to tell someone, just read the whole Bible. Because if we think about the, and pray over the implications of Jesus weeping, the idea that God would send his son to the world to live like us, experience life like us, and would have his, broken, his heart broken time and time and time again just like us, the understanding of the why behind these two words has more power than the quantity of the whole of Scripture. That's the heart of the light giver. Light givers don't aim to just give knowledge. They want to lead others to understanding. Second attribute. Light givers help people remember that the Bible is a voice to be heard, not a book to be read. Light givers help people remember that the Bible is a voice to be heard, not just a book to be read. Interpreting Scripture is an art and a science. In fact, my first year of seminary, I sat in Bible classes and, and I was taught how to read Scripture. So I heard words for the first time like hermeneutics and biblical exegesis and presuppositional understanding. And I was like, are you speaking English? Because I didn't understand that stuff. But it was important for, for me, it was important for people who go to seminary to understand that like, we don't read the Bible at face value. There's more to it. I sat in classes with professors that I can honestly say are some of the most intelligent minds on the Bible in the world today. It was an honor and it was a privilege and I was incredibly overwhelmed because I heard words for the first time and I felt like I was pretty smart. I heard words for the first time and I had no clue what they meant. When you think about it, the Bible that we have has been translated and put into a language for us to understand. And it was written thousands of years ago. And there are people in this world who have devoted their entire life to understand what the original Scripture means. And while I respect and I appreciate the many people who have devoted their life to understanding the Bible... I, I guarantee you, I didn't come into, one, in, into contact with one professor who didn't believe that the Bible wasn't just a book. The Bible, they would say, is, is the living, breathing Word of God today. The Bible is not just a book to know, they would say, but it's the voice of God speaking into our lives. In every class I was ever in with a, a seminary professor, They'd pray before class would start. And I'd hear them say, we just pray, Lord, for, for you to make the words come alive in our life. The smartest people in the world on the Bible, I'm sitting there, I'm just like, it's more than just knowledge. There's another aspect to this word. The words of God are not just words on a page, but the words of God have been breathed into us for generations. So the light givers among us, are they embrace the idea that the Bible is not just a book to understand, but it's the living, breathing voice of God in our lives today. The third attribute, light givers rescue the truth of God's word from distortion. I need you to stay with me on this one because some of you, this is you, and you've experienced this firsthand. I want just to put this out there. I believe that there are good, well-intentioned people who love the Lord, who want people to come to God. But they have made huge mistakes by distorting the words of the Bible. And they've actually pushed people away from it, away from God, because of their missteps regarding the Word of God. It's important for none of us to cherry-pick Scripture. It's important for, for all of us to realize that, that when we pick and choose Scripture to fit an agenda, it's not a good thing in terms of kingdom work. Because you can make God's Word anything you want it to be. In fact, many have. Cults have been built on this. Dangerous organizations have been built on a few verses that they've been able to twist and turn to make sound like what they wanted to make it sound like. If you want the Bible to fit your argument on anything, you can do it easily. I've seen it done. To be honest, I've probably done it. And I'm confessing that to you now. Like, I know in my life I've probably turned around and said something to someone like this. 
this is what the Bible says. And let me tell you, that's a dangerous statement within itself. And that's something that I hope you go away from this saying, like, I'm never going to say that to someone again. The words, this is what the Bible says, are dangerous. Because the Bible says a lot of stuff. There are 40 plus authors in the Bible. 60 plus books in the Bible. Speaking to a wide variety of people. And when we say the Bible says X, Y, Z... It's a dangerous statement because we can make it sound like whatever we want it to sound like. And we might take it completely out of context. We might take it completely out of what it was originally used for. But because it fits our narrative, we can use it and it becomes so dangerous for us. The Bible says a lot of things. And we can make it work for whatever we want it to. And if you've done this or if you've heard this in the past, let me just tell you, that has distorted the Word of God. Maybe not all the time, but there have been some times that the, the Word of God has been distorted. It happens all the time. I've done it. Ignorantly, I have. And, and I've prayed so much to God to say, Lord, keep those words. Keep the Bible says out of, out of my vocabulary. Like, if I'm going to say something like, Paul says from Romans to this people, great. I've asked God, God, just make sure that I don't say the Bible says to people because that is a dangerous statement to make. A perfect example of this, I love this, Jeremiah 29, at my last church, we'd have students choose verses for their confirmation verse. And I would say about 25% of the students would pick Jeremiah 29, 11, all right? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and to not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. People put that on bracelets, they put it on t-shirts, they put it up on walls. They love this verse, right? And why not? It sounds great. God wants you to be happy. And God's going to protect you. And, and if I'm a 14-year-old, that sounds pretty great. This is what I would pick too. And why not? Because whatever I want, God's plan is for me. And those plans are for me to be happy, and God's going to protect me in those plans. That's what it says. That, that God plans for you to prosper, to give you hope and a future. So whatever my plan is, that's God's plan, which is awesome. Right? That'd be great. My, whatever my plan is, God's plan, that's awesome. Let me tell you what's going on, Lord. This is what we're going to do today. But, wait, there's more. And a lot of people lose sight of that, especially if I'm a 14-year-old and I'm looking at one verse at a time. Let's read the whole thing. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with your, all your heart. Wait a second. That verse changes, right? That doesn't look the same. God's plan for me is to come to him to see what his plan is for me. That's confusing, especially if I just look at verse 11, right? God wants me to seek him in my planning. God wants us to seek him in our plans. You see what we do? We distort God's voice so easily just by cherry picking one verse and dropping it into our life. But if you look at the whole thing, there's more to it than that. Light givers... They rescue the distorted voice of God for the people who need to hear it. Jesus encountered this all the time. Again, the religious leaders, they would cherry pick verses. They would try to manipulate Scripture to fit their narrative. We see this in John chapter 8. The Pharisees are trying to catch Jesus in a trap with a woman who has just been caught in the act of adultery. In verse 4, they say this to Jesus. Teacher, they say to Jesus. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. Now the Pharisees, given the one verse from Leviticus, were on solid ground. They took one verse to build up their case, to justify their actions. But watch what Jesus says. Light giver Jesus. Here he comes. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, All right, 
But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Here, Jesus rescues the text from distortion. The distortion that the religious leaders of the time put into the text. So like Jesus, light givers among us feel like it's a mandate to rescue the text from those who distort it to use it to fit a a not God-sized agenda. You see what the religious leaders are trying to do here. They're trying to trap Jesus. The same religious leaders who who manipulated and and entrapped the, the word of God to build a case against Jesus and ultimately use God's word to execute him. These were the same men who knew the scriptures in and out. And they memorized the whole Bible and based on their agenda, which clearly did not come from God, manipulated God's voice, God's word to carry out their agenda. You see how easily this can happen. Jesus did his best to rescue the word of God from those who aimed to distort it to fit an agenda not derived from God. So like Jesus, the best light givers among us aim to rescue the truth of God's word from distortion. Fourth and last attribute I'll touch on this morning. Light givers help others embody the scriptures. In John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1, it says that Jesus is the Word and the Word became flesh. And that statement paired with the idea that Jesus dwells in us that we've talked about from Galatians 2 verse 20. And if these two, these two are truths for us, and if we are continually being transformed in the likeness of Christ, then we are the light bearers, the light givers of the Word of God in the world. We are the living, breathing example of God in the world. That might be intimidating for some of us, and that's okay. But I need you to think about this in an alternative universe right here. If, if all Bibles disappeared as the living, breathing example of God's Word, of Christ in the world, I argue that we would be okay. Why? Because essentially we would be the Bible for people who don't have the word of God. We are the word, we, we are Jesus in the word world, right? If, if he dwells in us, we are Jesus in the world. We are Christ who was the word, right? So I would argue there's nothing in the Bible that cannot be in you and me. Now, I understand that might rub some of you the wrong way. You're just like, no, Zach, we need the Bible. I'm not saying that, like, again, this is an alternative universe. It doesn't exist. I'm not saying that we just need to throw the Bible out and just be the Word of God for people. No, that's not what I'm saying. However, what I am saying is if, if the Word of God, the Bible as we know it, did not exist, I believe we'd be okay because we are Jesus in the world. If Jesus is the Word and Jesus dwells in us, then we are the Word. I'm not saying I'm, we're not going to read the Bible, okay? Please don't hear that. Don't go to your friends and be like, oh, the River Church doesn't read the Bible. No. I'm just making the argument that we are the Word of God for people who don't have the Word of God. The Word transforms us to be the Word of God for people who need the Word. Light givers among us help others understand that we are the Word for those who need the Word. So the four attributes, light givers, they don't aim to just give knowledge. They want to lead others to understanding. They help people remember the Bible is a voice to be heard, not just a book to be read. Light givers rescue the truth of God's word from distortion, and they help others embody the scriptures. These are just four of the many attributes that I believe light givers have that we find in Ephesians 4. And if this is you, if I've described you in any way, awesome. Praise God. The world needs more light givers. This church needs more light givers. Let's make this clear too. If that's not you, and you don't feel like you could ever stand up in front of of people and, and talk about the Word of God, that is great. Paul gives us four other gifts in Ephesians 4. That each of us has the ability to fulfill roles for the church. 
And I don't want you to get caught up, just like I said last week, I don't want you to get caught up in titles, like because no one calls you a pastor, you can't be a pastor. That's not true. Because you're not a pastor, you can't be an apostle. That's not true. These are just titles. Don't get caught up in the titles that we as people, as, as human beings, make up because God has divinely inspired roles and not titles. Don't let any obstacle get in your way. If you're a light giver, if you're a teacher, pursue that calling. If that's not you, pursue being an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, or a shepherd, a pastor, as best as you can because God has divinely inspired that gift to be into, into your life. Because we are an extension of Christ in this world and God needs us to be an extension. Because we have the ability to be the word of God in the world. As we invite the band back up to lead us into more worship, I just ask you, as we're kind of nearing the end of this series, I would ask you to ask God, go to God today, and ask God, what gifts have you infused into my life in this season to be Jesus in our church, to be Jesus in our homes, to be Jesus in our workplaces, to be Jesus in our communities? Because without a doubt in my mind, God has called each in every one of us to do something great in his name. And I believe now is a, is a good time as ever to just say yes to whatever God has put on your heart, whatever God has put as a calling in your life. Now is a great time to say yes to that calling. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this place. Thanks for what you're doing here, how you're continually revealing yourself all around us. Lord God, I thank you for these people that, that you have called them, that you know them, that you've numbered the very hairs on their, their heads, that you love them, that you, you've uniquely gifted and equipped them to live out your mission of restoration here in this church in Delavan, in our community, in Walworth County. God, you have called us to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and shepherds and teachers for the sake of your mission in the world. Lord, I just continue to call us. Continue to encourage us and equip us and send us to be a part of your plans for the world. Lord God, I'm excited for what you're doing here. I look around and I see people realizing more and more what your plan is for them, not just to come through those doors on Sunday morning, but to be the church outside those walls. All things begin and end with you as the head, as you as the cornerstone, Lord, and we, we just want to be your body. We want to be your hands and feet. We want to be an extension of you in the world. We're ready to work for you, God. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We ask all of this in your son's name. Amen.